Welcome to Bible study. Today we have a study of a psalm you may not know quite as well as you do Psalm 19, Psalm 1, Psalm uh, 23, of course, everybody knows, or Psalm 51. It's Psalm 32. Now, in order for this to make sense, let's get it in a historic con you know, context. All of us remember King David. He's the high watermark of the Old Testament, as you well know. Mentioned in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament character. Okay, he becomes king. He moves the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. Takes him about a year to get everybody on board in all the land. The northern part uh, didn't buy in early in the game. And then he begins his reign. Now, it's a wonderful golden age. However, you do remember that Bay David stumped his toe. Uh, one night after supper, he goes out on the porch and he looks across the neighborhood's fence. There's a lady over there, his neighbor, who's bathing outdoors. And the long and the short of it, he invites a courier to bring her to the palace. Her husband is at the front fighting with the army. And you know the story. It's found in 2 Samuel, verse chapters 11 and 12. Uh, he ends up breaking five commandments in this fiasco of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not envy, and thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, he does all of that. You know the story. Uh, he thinks everything's going to be fine because the next day the lady goes back to her home after they have had a night of adultery. And uh, everything's fine. Everybody sails along for a few months, and then she writes him a note and says, uh, by the way, I'm with child. Oh, well, that complicates things. And so he sends word to his captain of the Abner of the army, hey, uh, send her husband back for R&R. &R. Well, he comes back, okay, and uh, his name's Uriah. And so David thinks, well, he's here for R&R. &R. He'll be here a week or so, and everybody, when she is pregnant, won't think anything about it, okay? Well, just so happens, he wants to rob the, can't sleep one night. And he starts down the steps in the palace, and good grief, he almost stumbles over this guy sleeping on the landing. It's Uriah. He says, Uriah, what are you doing here? You need to be home with your wife and enjoying the privilege of being a husband. He says, my friends are losing their lives for our kingdom. And I can't, I can't with good conscience enjoy the privileges of home with them fighting on the battlefield. Well, that complicates things. So David sends word to Abner, says, make a charge. And then on a given signal, tell all the men, cue them all in, except Uriah, and withdraw. And they do that. And, of course, the enemy overwhelms and kills him. Everybody's so sorry about his death, but they don't know the story, the inside story. Well, what happens? Well, God speaks to Nathan, the second prophet in the Old Testament. Samuel's the first prophet. And... He tells Nathan the story. Nathan confronts David, one of the most dramatic pictures of the Old Testament, in front of the court. There probably were 20, 30, 40 people around all the time. And he says, uh, he tells him a story, and David's very upset about what he hears. There was an old man who had just a little plot of land and one little ewe lamb, and he enjoyed that little ewe lamb, no more family, and the king lived next door and had herds and all sorts of privileges. And the king, or the man next door, decided he wanted this land. So he told some folk to go to the marketplace and say, this man 
blaspheme God. And they did that, and they took him out and stoned him. And then the wife of, you know, Jezebel, uh, in turn, uh, said to the king, uh, well, hey, what are you pouting around? This guy's gone. Go over there and get that land and that land. And he did. And David was very upset. So he said, you know, he just walked right into that verbal trap. He said, tell me, Nathan, who it is. And you remember Nathan pointed his finger in his face and says, thou art the man. And in fairness to David, when he realized that his sins were exposed, he confessed. And that it, that's what he had done. And everybody all over Jerusalem on the six o'clock news, very embarrassing to the cause. Weeks passed and he writes Psalm 51 and he pours out his heart to God asking for forgiveness. That's one of the greatest forgiveness, uh, Psalms of forgiveness in the Old Testament. And then God grants him forgiveness. And then he writes this Psalm, Psalm 32. So we come to the text. I hope you have your Bible, Sandy. Blessed is he whose transgression, that word in Hebrew means a willful rebellion, is forgiven, whose sin is covered then verse 2, he elaborates a little bit. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Iniquity means wandering away from the right path. Impute is a word in Hebrew which means to hold an account. If CPA, you borrow money from somebody, they make a record of it, and they hold it against you. You have to pay it back. And now, because of his sins, he has all of this guilt. He has all of this as a record, and he is miserable. And the psalmist goes on to say, and it's David. He said, he's at least honest about it. Look what he says. When I kept silent, my bones grew old. Through my groaning all the day long, for the day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into drought of summer. Guilt is a dreadful thing. It, you can't get away from it. You've experienced it. I've experienced it. Every person's experienced it. And sin comes at you in three ways. Sins which we commit. That's sins of commission. Secondly, sins of omission. The things we should have done and did not do. And the sin of disposition. Maybe you and I do all as we should, but we have a sorry attitude, critical, complaining, picky, picky, picky. You know, pick a little, talk a little, pick a little, talk a little. And that is sin too. And when you and I don't fess up, what this is saying is you and I have to be honest with God and with ourselves. That's what David says in verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you. He was honest. If you and I are not honest with God, there isn't going to be any forgiveness. And he said, in my iniquity I have not hidden. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, that and you in Hebrew is emphatic. What it's underlining and saying in a loud voice is God is the only one that can forgive you and me of sin. And when that happens, then the guilt is gone. Uh, I can remember when we lived in Stillwater, Oklahoma, our youngest son, David, was playing with the doctor's uh, kid across the street. He had a very nice garden over there. And he had a number of tomatoes, and they decided it would be fun to, to have a tomato fight. And they climbed in his garden. I didn't know about this till later, Lord knows. And they picked the tomatoes off the vines and threw them at each other until the tomatoes were all gone. Okay. Now, guess what? 
At supper that night, the doorbell rang. So I went to the door. There stood the doctor. And the doctor said, let me tell you a story. He told me the story. Well, I tell you what, we had a come to Jesus meeting with David. And he, he cried and he was apologetic. I said, now David, I'm gonna go down and buy three dozen tomatoes and you are going to carry those across the street and ring that doorbell and you're gonna apologize and I'm gonna be standing about five feet behind you, not say a word, but you're going to do it and you're going to give Dr. Emerson these tomatoes. Well, needless to say, he wasn't excited about that. So we walked across the street and he walked like he was going to his grave and we rang the doorbell and he handed him the tomatoes and cried and apologized and the doctor was very gracious and he took the tomatoes, we walked, but as we walked back across the street, he was skipping along and smiling, everything was A-OK. -okay. And that's what happens when you and I acknowledge our sin. And the scripture says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You know, God's the only one that can forgive you and me. I don't know how strong you are, but you cannot pick up yourself, nor can I, nor can anyone. Get that jump rope and lay it on the ground. Pick up both ends and stand on it. And see if you can pick yourself up. God alone can forgive us. Now, what happens when that takes place? Well, he, David gives a testimony. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near you. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. These three yous are emphatic in Hebrew. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Now God responds in verse 8, 9, and 9 to David. And here's what he says. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which has to be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. That is the forgiveness abilities. And David sings a doxology in the last two verses. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, and he who trusts in the Lord's mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. He's saying, hey, when the Lord forgives us, let's make a sound off about it. Let's tell everybody where forgiveness can be found. Uh, we live in an age in which a lot of people think that they can do very well without the Lord. There are plenty of salvation substitutes out there. Why do people commit suicide? Why do people string out on alcohol or drugs? They're looking for a purpose. They're looking for a mean, meaning in life. And when we find the Lord, we find a purpose to live. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. And he's the one that makes us laugh. So it's a wonderful thing to know. Yes, Psalm 51, when David pours his heart out for forgiveness. But yes, Psalm 32, the marvelous chapter that he writes after he finds God's forgiveness. And that's for you and that's for me and any of us who will call upon the Lord. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, when you preach, sometimes people say, you said something today that sticks with me. And several times I've said, and it's not original with me, there is more grace than God than there is sin in you and me. And that's a marvelous thing. The most heavy word in the New Testament, full of mercury, is grace. 
For it is by God's grace that you and I are saved and forgiven. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, as Paul readily knew. And so that's the good news of the gospel for today and for every day. Let's close with a word of prayer and a word of humor. Lord, we thank you that you put up with us. We thank you that you're the one, you're in fact the only thing that we must have to successfully and happily live. Nothing else can fit that vacuum. As Augustine said, thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our souls are restless until they find their rest in thee. So in forgiveness and your free grace, we'll live our lives until the time comes when we can stand in your presence and praise your holy name. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Now remember, life can close in on you and me. Don't lose our sense of humor. Do you know when a door is not a door? When it's a jar. Have a great day, everybody.